Does anybody know what today's date is? February 22nd, 2 2 2. I find that oddly appropriate since we're talking about couples this evening. 2 2 2. Uh, we're continuing, this is the second message in our series, uh, loosely based on the Song of Songs. Now, I say loosely based uh, because unlike other messages that I've done in the past, I'm not really going sort of verse by verse or passage by passage. Uh, through the book. I'm sort of taking themes. In fact, tonight's text is not even from the Song of Songs. It's a, it's a related text that talks about some, some issues that are, that are surfaced later in the song. We'll return to the song next week. Uh, but last week we began by talking about friend relationships. That awkward zone of more than buddy-buddy, but not really a formalized romantic relationship. And I talked about why those are really dangerous situations to find yourself in, because people get their hearts broken in those sort of situations. And when you find yourself in a friend relationship, you either need to step up into a formalized romantic relationship or gently disengage and re enter the realm of, of we understand we're both friends uh, and avoid uh, sort of waffling on in that sea of indecision and leaving a big crater in the ground at the end. And there were two verses that I pointed to. The first verse uh, came from the Song of Songs. It said, do not stir up or awaken love until it's time to come, until, it, until it's the right time. Uh, and the second was, the heart is deceitfully wicked. The heart is infinitely wicked. And that is never more true than in the realm of relationships. And when you combine those two verses, you get this, this, this problem. That if we're not very alert to what we're doing, and not very aware of how our relationships are proceeding, we will often deceive ourselves and find ourselves having stirred up love far before its time has come. And, and why is that so bad? Has anybody ever woken you up like an hour before your alarm clock is supposed to go off? <laughs> Did that just not ruin your whole day? Okay, it's no better when love's alarm clock goes off an hour earlier than it's supposed to. Um, same concept here. Wait until the right time for love to be awakened. Um, that was sort of the negative side of things, avoiding friend relationships. Tonight, I want to talk to you about the positive side of things. So what should a healthy romantic relationship look like? What is the dance of romance? What is the tune to which it, to which it moves? Well, there are a lot of different ways I could go with this, but, but the most important message I want to repeat tonight from last week is there is no one right way to do it. There is no one true path, and I keep emphasizing that because there are many Christian teachers who seem to believe that there is just one right way, and it's, and it's clearly laid out in some passage of the Bible. And I strongly reject that notion. And I'll talk to you instead about some principles that I think have bearing on the idea of romantic relationships. Now, why is it that I'm spending so much time talking about romance? I mean, everyone knows people don't really date at Stanford. Here's why. <laughs> a, some do. And I know it. B, you only make a few major decisions in your life. And you spend the rest of your life managing those decisions. Who you marry is about the biggest decision you're going to make. And everything that you do romantically is a prelude to, well, at this point in your life, is a prelude to your marriage. You're either making it more likely you will have a, a, a God-honoring and harmonious marriage, uh, a, a fulfilling marriage, a wonderful marriage, or you're making it less likely by the choice that you make in your male-female interactions, specifically those that have romantic overtones. And so whether you're single, or whether you're dating, whether you're engaged, um, what I'm talking about has great bearing on your life. And so I urge you, lend me your ears. Tonight, I read a lengthy passage from the Bible. It's in the book of Genesis, chapter 24, uh, and it's, it's Abraham is getting very old in age, and he's looking for a spouse for his son. He wants his son to find a wife. Starting in verse 1, and it'll be on the screen. Abraham was now old and well advanced in your... Oh, change the translation. Abraham was now a very old man. The Lord had made him rich, and he was successful in everything he did. One day, Abraham called in his most trusted servant and said to him, Solemnly promise me, in the name of the Lord, who rules heaven and earth, that you won't choose a wife for my son Isaac from the people here in the land of Canaan. Instead, go back to the land where I was born and find a wife for him from among my relatives, which is less weird than it sounds. But the servant asked, what if the young woman I choose refuses to leave home and, I don't have her anywhere else, thank you, come here with me. Should I send Isaac there to look for a wife? No, Abraham answered. Don't ever do that, no matter what. The Lord who rules heaven brought me here from the land where I was born and promised that he would give this land to my descendants forever. When you go back there, the Lord will send his angel ahead of you to help you find a wife for my son. Cupid! No, I'm kidding. Cupid's not the Bible, but that's a close thing to <laughs> um, If the woman refuses to come along, you don't have to keep this promise. But don't ever take my son back there. So the servant gave 
Abraham his word that he would do everything he had been told to do. Soon after that, the servant loaded ten of Abraham's camels with valuable gifts. Then he set out for the city in northern Syria, where Abraham's brother Nahor lived. When he got there, he let the camels rest near the well outside the city. It was late afternoon, the time when the women came out for water. The servant prayed, You, Lord, are the God my master Abraham worships. Please keep your promise to him and let me find a wife for Isaac today. The young women of the city will soon come to this well for water, and I'll ask one of them for a drink. If she gives me a drink and then offers to get some water for my camels, I'll know she is the one you have chosen and that you have kept your promise to my master. While he was still praying, a beautiful unmarried young woman came by with a water jar on her shoulder. She was Rebecca, the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Abraham's brother Nahor, and his wife Milcah. Rebecca walked past Abraham's servant, then went over to the well and filled her water jar. When she started back, Abraham's servant ran to her and said, Please let me have a drink of water. I'll be glad to, she answered. Then she quickly took the jar from her shoulder and held it while he drank. After he had finished, she said, Now I'll give your camels all the water they want. She quickly poured out water for them, and she kept going back for more, until his camels had drunk all they wanted. Abraham's servant did not say a word, but he watched everything. Rebecca did, because he wanted to know for certain if this was the woman the Lord. The servant brought along an expensive gold too large for when Rebecca finished bringing the water, he gave her the ring for her nose. What do you know? She's a California girl. And the bracelet for her arms. Then he said, Please tell me who your father is. Does he have room in his house for me and my men to spend the night? She answered, My father's Bethuel, or in Milka. We have a place where you and your camels, your men, can stay. And we also have enough straw and feed for your camels. Then the servant bowed his head and prayed, Thank you, Lord, God, my master Abraham. You have led me to his relatives and kept your promise to him. What a bizarre way to choose a spouse. How goofy. Now, there are principles in here that I think that we can, we can actually find useful in our context. But clearly, that's not the model that I'm expected to follow. You don't even own camels. You don't have a well. And that's the problem with the one true path methodology when it comes to dating in the Bible. Uh, these only work in certain cultural contexts, and they only make sense uh, when you've got a whole cultural infrastructure supporting it. Here are five other ways that people have found true love in the Bible. Okay? <laughs> you can take a nap and wake up married. Uh, I recommend that if you can have it happen. Um, right now, the only place that happens is in Vegas, I think. But that was in the Garden of Eden. Um, uh, of course, you could force me to collect 200 foreskins as a present. Uh, and, you know, geez, why? haven't you ever heard of flowers? <laughs> Yuck. Um, kidnapping. Uh, you see that in Judges. Uh, girls came out to dance, and the men were like, yes! And they just picked them over their shoulders and ran home and got married. Um, buy property, but don't read the fine print. That's how Ruth and, uh, and Boaz got married. Or hold a beauty pageant and marry the winner, which only works if you are the king. Um, or, you know. So, now, the Bible does not even endorse all these methods. Specifically kidnapping. No, no. Um, uh, and I would personally frown upon the foreskin thing. <laughs> not my advice. Um, Take that up with, with me in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. It's a, a real strategy you're planning to pursue. Um, you know, FTV is much more desirable. Um, and uh, none of these will work in our society, obviously. None of these will work in our context. Instead, what we have to do as believers is find the, the method that our society um, sort of flows in and then find a way to use that method in a way that does not bring dishonor to God or lead to sin in our lives. Because the whole cultural infrastructure is built up around a certain type of method. Now, maybe you're an international student from another culture, um, and, and perhaps you're from a culture that has arranged marriages. That's fine. There's nothing sinful or evil about that. Um, and actually, statistically, arranged marriages have a better success rate than, than chosen marriages by people because, you know, you let a bunch of 18-year-olds pick the destiny of their lives and they don't do as good of a job as a bunch of 40-year-olds who have seen what makes marriage work. Um, but whatever model you follow, I think there are key principles. Now, the thing is, we look at these things and we laugh. I want to point out to you that we do things that are equally goofy in our society today. And I'd like to show you one of the goofy things that we do. Have you ever heard of a thing called speed dating? <laughs> Did anybody do the speed dating thing over at, what was it, Robley earlier this year or was it Toyota? Where was it? Branner. Branner. Of course it was Branner. Um, where was I thinking? Did anybody, will anybody fess up to having done the speed dating at Branner this year? Okay. 
This is a Christian version of speed dating. And I would like you to just meditate on this video and think, I can do better than that. <laughs> I had to take the to the airport. I got a seven and I dropped it off at seven because it was <laughs> Hey, I'm Jake. Hi, I'm Sarah. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. Uh, what are you uh, what are you doing? You know, no no touching before the marriage, right? Cuz uh, touching just leads to bad things. <laughs> Hi. Uh, my name is Mark. Uh, what's your name? Oh, I'm Sarah. Nice to meet you. Uh, it's nice to meet you. Do you love kids? Uh, I never really thought about Okay, because I love kids. I mean, I want to have tons of them. I mean, the first one, naturally, I'd name Adam. And then, uh, if they're boys, you know, like, uh, Cain and then Abel. <laughs> Cain wasn't that great, but uh, whatever. Hi. 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 Yeah. I'm Sarah. Nice to meet you, Sarah. Well, you know what the Bible says about it. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. So, um, I need my eyes to drive, so I just wear this when I know there's going to be women around. How beautiful you are, my darling. Your eyes behind your veil and doves, your eyes like a flock of goats descending from Mount Gilead. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bruce. Let's pray. Father <laughs> God, tell me if this is the girl that I'm going to marry. Please make it clear right now if I'm going to marry this girl. I would love, love to uh, to shake your hand, but um, that was inappropriate. I'm I'm sorry. Um, and then some of the girls, I'd like to name like Eve and uh, Ada and Zella, and you know I'd want to stay away from like Jezebel. Or, uh, Bathsheba, I don't think they're very good. Well, uh, you know, I'm no King David. I mean, look what happened to him when he looked at a woman. <laughs> Tell me, you whom I love, right now make it clear, Father God. Do you go here? I was also thinking like Oklahoma. I, I know it's not biblical, but I think it'd be a really cool name to name a daughter, you know, like Oklahoma, the musical, it's one of my favorite musicals. <laughs> Your lips are like a scarlet ribbon. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Did you hear that? I'm gonna go call mom and dad. <laughs> this is torture. Wanna well, skip this and go get a cup of coffee? Yes. Mom and dad are on the phone. They want to welcome you to the family. Uh, hold on. What was your name again? <laughs> <laughs> so while we throw stones at the biblical methods uh, that people used back then to find dates, we haven't really improved a whole lot in uh, 2,000 years. We still do things because love makes us stupid. So tonight, I just want to give you the seven deadly sins of dating and the ten biblical, well, the ten commandments, the ten commandments of dating. And then I want to do a Q&A time just like we did last week, and that will be the bulk of our time together. So I'm going to hit these very quickly. So what are the seven deadly sins? What should you not do? Uh, first, ditching your friends is one of the deadly sins of dating. Ditching your friends. Uh, when you become that joined at the hip couple, if you enter into a romantic relationship and your world becomes smaller rather than larger, you're probably in sin. And I don't necessarily mean sexual sin, although you might be. Um, you're, you're, you're hurting other people, and you're hurting yourself in the long run because most romantic relationships do not work out. You're burning bridges that you'll want to walk across later. Um, yeah, I don't want to spend too much time. It should be obvious. Don't, don't do that. If you meet with someone, they've got a circle of friends, you've got a circle of friends, there should be like an amoeba-like joining, a blob that emerges, as opposed to like the Venn diagram intersection of your mutual friends. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Sin number two, uh, dating someone you would never consider marrying. Okay, you're going to wind up marrying somebody that you dated. 
That's your pool of eligible potential mates. By the way, someone asked me, would you please stop referring to dating as a mate selection process? It makes you sound warm. Um, okay. But nonetheless, this is ultimately about spousal selection. Um, and so, just why in the world would you begin dating someone and potentially arouse either desires and passions within them or within yourself that you know you will never fulfill? That's just me. Don't do that. Um, saying God told me to. Okay, that is hugely wrong. Either God told me to date you or God told me to break up with you. Never, ever, 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 ever do that. Um, if God spoke to you, um, then just keep it to yourself and trust that God is equally capable of speaking to them. Look at that passage that we just read from Genesis. Eliezer had a specific sign from God, right? Did he say to her, God told you to marry? No. He just said, wow, this is great. Can I go visit your house and work out with your family? He didn't say all the stuff that was going on. We, as the audience observe, he didn't do that. I would suggest to you that's a good model. Never, ever, especially at the breakup. God told me to break up with you. Have some courage. Um, I don't think I should see you anymore. Um, letting intimacy outstrip commitment. That's a huge sin, and it's a very common one. There, there's this thing. Okay, guys tend to desire contact, like physical contact. Girls tend to desire commitment. And so guys will trade away a little bit of commitment in order to gain some contact. And girls will trade away a little bit of contact to get a little bit of commitment in return. And it's this funnel that leads you down this road that you, you both wind up in this place you're never meant to be. Like, he's like trapped in this relationship that he was just in for fun. And she's like, oh my God, I don't think he really loves me. No, he doesn't. Um, don't let, especially, I mean, don't, don't start doing that trade, tip for tat. Um, number two, uh, be sure and keep your commitment and your intimacy, both emotional and physical, all sort of on the same plane. For instance, this thing works between acquaintances and friends, right? Uh, like, you don't, like, hug or even shake hands, like, regularly, like, be affectionate towards uh, people you just barely know. But you might, like, if you're very, really excited about something, hug or, like, high-five or put your hand around the back of someone who's a friend. Because you've got a level of physical intimacy that parallels the level of, of commitment that you have to that person. Now, when you're in the world of romance, whole new realms become open to you. Um, but even then, there should be a difference. Like, you need to date in such a way that there is room for you to express more physical intimacy uh, when you are engaged. And that there is room for you to express more physical intimacy when you are married. There is a hard line around marriage. All sexual activity should only be within marriage. Outside of that, you need to have a realm, and we'll talk more about this next week, um, in what I call the thrill of the chaste. <laughs> um, I love the titles of this series, Relationships, The Dance of Romance, The Thrill of the Chaste. I'm on a roll, baby. Um, hard line outside sex. No marriage until sex. I mean, no sex until marriage. <laughs> That's going right on Google, baby. Um, no sex until marriage. Um, Outside of that, you need to have room to grow. Some, because the way most college students date, you do everything all at once. Or you do so much all at once that there's no way for, as your level of commitment grows, for you to reflect that in your level of intimacy. They need to be in parallel. Uh, changing who you are just to the other person. Don't do that. Now, should you be open to changing as a person? Yes, it's part of the maturation process. But don't, I mean, I don't care how, how cute he is, or how hot she, or he, she is. You, that is not worth sacrificing 18, 20 years of your life in character formation in order to make them happy. Don't do it. A, it won't work in the long run. And B, it's not wise. It won't work in the long run because you can't, by simple off-on switch, change what it's taking you 20 years to become overnight. If they can't take you for who you are, that's a clue that they're not the one for you. Um, Overanalyzing the relationship. Girls are particularly prone to this. Guys do it too sometimes. Um, you know what? Uh, there, there's been interesting research done on it, on how overanalyzing relationships makes them worse. And what it tends to do is to prolong bad relationships. You know what the best predictor of, of a romantic couple still being together in six months is? Their gut feeling if you ask them, do you still think you'll be together in six months? What comes off the top of their head is the best predictor, yes or no. If you give them time to think about it, their accuracy goes way down. Because they convince themselves, remember the heart is wicked, deceitful above all things, who can know it? 
they begin to convince themselves of all the good things in a relationship, and they forget about the bad things. Don't overanalyze a relationship. Roll with it. And then the final deadly sin is taking the other person for granted. And guys and girls are equally prone to this. Um, you're trying to build a foundation for a healthy marriage. You're trying to learn the skills necessary for a healthy marriage, even if you don't marry this person, and you won't marry most people that you date. You still need to begin building the skill set that you will need to not take your spouse for granted after a decade, after three decades, after 50 years. And if you start building that habit into your life of taking people for granted when you're just dating them, it will be very difficult to break it once you made a commitment. Okay. These are my Ten Commandments of Dating. Now, I need to say something, and, and I've heard this said by a pastor very recently, Mark Batterson of National Community Church in Washington, D.C. He said, these are, these, now these are different Ten Commandments, but this was his, he was doing the Ten Commandments of Dating, too. He said, look, these did not come down off Mount Sinai. These are not written on stone. They're my opinion. In general, the further I get away from the biblical text, the more you have freedom to disagree with me. And sometimes you're going to be very far away. You may disagree with me more than you normally would in a message. That's okay. However, I would tell you this. I've been doing college ministry for a long time, and I've seen far more romances begin, blossom, and flame out than you can imagine. I speak from a vantage point of wisdom here. So, so listen to what I say carefully. The first thing you need to do is trust God. Do you remember that, that one thing that I sort of drew attention to jokingly? God will send his angel before you to help find this, this mate for, for Abraham's son. Now, I'm not promising that God's got an angel looking out for your romantic prospects. Um, I don't think that's biblical. But what I do believe is that God's got it under control. Either he will help you find a person for whom you are well suited and who is well suited for you, or he will give you the gift of celibacy and will enable you to be satisfied in that. Either way, it will work out as long as you remain yielded to him in your life. Don't stress. Far too many believers go nuts because they haven't found a spouse by the time they're age, X, Y, Z, whatever. Trust God. Number two, you need to focus on becoming the right person rather than finding the right person. It's the golden rule, right? Treat other people the way that you wish they would treat you. Somewhere out there, for almost all of you, probably all of you, statistically, there's a spouse right now. You just haven't met her or him yet. Okay? What do you hope that person is doing right now? You hope they're becoming a person whom you can go mad over. A person of great character. A person of, of, of humor and compassion and, and, and all these wonderful attributes. Do the same thing for them. Make yourself a gift to your spouse someday, even though you don't know who they are yet. If you do that, you'll be very happy with the result. Um, don't date someone who doesn't share your deepest values. Very important. Now, specifically, this means for Christians, you should never date a non-believer, someone who is not a Christian, ever. Now, you say, but I know someone who did it and it worked out. Yeah, well, that's nice. Sometimes people survive being struck by lightning, too. It doesn't mean it's a good idea. Um, if you begin dating someone who doesn't share your deepest values, you are like someone who drinks and drives. You're taking a chance. You're deliberately putting yourself in a situation where you know you are likely, for at least part of the time, to be out of your mind. It's called romance. It's love. You're, you're in a relationship. You're saying, yes, we're going we're gonna to be together. And, and at some point in that relationship, your brain's going to turn off. And your homeboy's going to grab the reins and take over. And you may find yourself falling far more for the other person than you ever thought you would. You thought it would be a simple, casual relationship. And you're deeply in love with it. Don't even walk down the road. It's just foolish from every level imaginable. You've got to make sure whoever you date shares your deepest values. And not just your religious values. Um, but if, if, for example, family is an extremely important value to you, you need to make sure the person that you start dating, and of course some of this you discover as you're dating. I mean, you don't like have them fill out a resume before they ask you out or anything. But once you become aware that you really differ over deep fundamental values, like they, they don't value family at all, hey, wow, you need to back off. Because that will not work. I've just seen it too many times. It will cause many tears in your life. Number five, plan for purity. Um, I'll talk much more about this next week, so I won't talk about it much right now. Uh, except to say, you need to make decisions in advance of the place where the decision is called for. And I think it should be obvious why. We'll talk much more about it next week. 
Uh, number six, hang out at the right well. No, wait, which one am I? Number four. Did I skip four? Yes. Oh, thank you. Look before you leap. Um, watch from the shadows is the ominous way to put it. Dum, 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 dum. Look before you leap. Okay, Eleazar went and back to Genesis 24. He went and he watched the girl before he approached her. He tried to observe her character before he tried to engage her relationally. I think that's a good principle. You need to, as much as you can, have a read on a person before you allow yourself to become romantically involved with them. Now, the reason, and I want to be clear about this, the reason we have the dating process, like we've got a tiered relational process for a reason. Mar like, you know, you just say, it's time for me to get married. You'll do, you know, no! You, you have this tiered thing where you have a binding commitment of marriage, irreversible for life, that's the goal, um, in the biblical standard. You commit to that. Since that's such a big deal, you've got this period of engagement that surrounds it, that is breakable. The point of engagement is that it can be broken. That is why you have an engagement process. So you have a, a chance to get out if you really just become aware that it's not going to work. And even more casual than that is dating. And the reason you have dating is because you can't just become engaged to the first person you think is cute. You have to learn more about them. And so, of course, dating involves learning more about the other person. That's cool. But you need to have at least a minimal set of knowledge to assure yourself this person is not, say, an axe murderer um, before you begin dating them. And you should also have ascertained, is this person a believer or not? You should know that. It shouldn't be something you date to find out. You should really know, this person loves God in a way that I can respect and we can be partners together in. Okay, skipping ahead to number six. Hang out at the right well. So Eliezer, um, he's looking for a spouse for, for this, this war that he's, that he's supposed to, to take care of. He goes to the place he knows he is most likely to find the kind of person he's looking for. He's been given specific constraints. Has to be a person who comes from this tribe. So where does he go? Where that tribe hangs out? Okay, you've got specific constraints on who you're going to marry someday. If you're a follower of Christ, a believer, you need to hang out where other single believers are if you, if you think marriage is part of your future. That's one thing that's great about a place like Chi Alpha. That's one reason, although it's not the main reason you should be involved in a church. Um, you've got to do that. Otherwise, if you spend all your time at the wrong well, at a bunch of frat parties, um, hanging out with people who don't share your values at all, you will wind up falling for one of them eventually. And you wind up regretting it five, ten years down the road. Go to the right well. Okay, number seven. Have lots of casual dates, but few serious relationships. I, I would say date wide. Because I define date very simply. A date is a social activity with a guy and a girl. If you're in that, it's you and one other person of the opposite gender, you're having fun together, you're on a date. Whether you like the other person or not, that's a definition of a date. Do that a lot. You will learn things about people. Now, when you go from date to dating, that's a different story altogether. You should have few serious relationships in your life. You should, you should not try to, to, to rack the tally up. Here's why. Um, when you have a bunch of serious relationships, go up close to one another and then break up, what you're training yourself to do is to harden your heart. And you are preparing yourself for divorce. You are in training for divorce when you do that. Don't do that. It's not proof. Not if your goal is to have a lifelong, meaningful relationship. Number rate, master your emotions. You're in control, not them. The way we talk about love is funny to me. I fell in love. What, like you stepped off a cliff and gravity took over? No. You allowed yourself to be overwhelmed with attraction. You have the brakes on this thing. Now, it's not always easy, and I'm not saying that it is. But you are always in control. Your will can trump your emotions. And so monitor them closely. Don't allow them, just like I said, don't let intimacy outstrip commitment. You know, don't let commitment outstrip wisdom. Know where you're at in a relationship and know what's an appropriate level of infatuation to feel. Master it, or it will master you. And it will ride you and leave you bloody and dry at the end of the desert road. Nine, you need to periodically evaluate the relationship. This is just something you should think, like, every month or two. I'm just going to sit down and think, am I a better person because I'm in this relationship? On the whole, I mean, of course, like, if you just had a big fight the night before, <laughs> don't evaluate it in light of that. But like, on the whole, like, you know, over the last few weeks, am I a better person? If the answer is no, dude, it's just a, just a dating relationship. Break it off. That's the point of a dating relationship. You prune it so that something better may grow in its place. 
If it's making you a worse person, why in the world would you stay in there with the thought that maybe someday I'll get married to someone who makes me a worse person? That's not good. Or makes my life less desirable or less, less joyful. Don't do that. Final one. Uh, don't tell God how it has to be. I meet a lot of Christians who do this. God, if you're going to give me a mate, it's going to be, you know, he's got to be this way, and he's got to act this way, and he's got to do this. No. Now, it's good to have standards and goals, yes. Hopes. Um, but it's not good to have a rigid cookie cutter that you put everything that God brings your way through. You know, he's got and you're not. And his plan, I mean, let's go back to how God hooked some people up in the Bible. Through a, through a weird property contract, Ruth and Boaz. Ruth did not grow up thinking, I bet someday I'll get my husband because he's going to buy a farm and I'll come with it. That was not, and Boaz was not thinking, you know what? I bet someday I will just buy a piece of property and I'll get a wife with that deal. That was never part of his plan. But it was God's plan. Be open to something strange happening, something way outside your paradigm. Use wisdom, but be open. That's all that I really want to say to you tonight from the, from the prayer text that I have. I just want to take the next few minutes that we have and just do some Q&A with you. Um, and just like I did last week, handle some of these things that are, that are coming up. Now, there were some questions I got before, and I just want to hit two of them real quick. Um, what if I don't want to date anybody right now? Don't. That's easy. Um, <laughs> uh, and number four, uh, I, I skipped a few other questions. What about internet dating sites? They seem kind of weird to me. Well, they seem kind of weird to me too, but whatever. I don't care how you mean. I care how you behave. So anyway, any other questions you guys have? All right. Eric. Say there are two people. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I have and a friend. Then, okay, go on. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, it's two people. I've been uh, have been good friends for a long time. Yeah. A lot of mutual respect for each other. Any tips about how one would go about seeing if there is reciprocal romantic interest? Exactly. You're a sharp man. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there is really only one way, and that is to ask. Um, and to and it's it's very very risky. Like it is much easier to go from barely knowing someone to dating them than it is to go from being a good friend with someone to dating them. Like the, the barely knowing to dating is a pretty easy transition because there's a low risk. I mean, it's all gain, no loss, right? I may get a date out of this, and if not, I didn't know her anyway. Um, however, if you got a friendship, you're running the risk of botching, and so you really need to analyze this. Um, however. I would say that probably the, the worst thing you could do is go through the rest of your life wondering if she would have said yes. And so find a time. <laughs> no, find a time uh, that you think is appropriate, like not right in the middle of like, you know, Kim class or something. Um, that's pass her note, do you like me? If so, check yes. If not, check no, pass back discreetly. Um, uh, but just say, hey, would you like to go get, you know, hey, you want to go out for coffee? Use the word go out. Um, and she says yes, then that is a clue. It's a flag that maybe you can, you can just say, hey, I'm, I'm interested. You know, do that again and again. And eventually, you know, women aren't stupid. Um, she will notice that, wow, you're paying special interest to me. Um, I'm not comfortable with that. Or, yippee! <laughs> um, and if after two or three days she hasn't, like, tried to distance herself from you in some way, no guarantees. Because she, she you know, guys are cowards when they won't ask. Girls are cowards when they won't warn guys off because they don't want to hurt their feelings. That's a wrong thing to do. If you know you don't want to date them, let them know. Um, but there's a good chance that she's open to you asking. She's wondering what's taking you so long. Thanks, I'll tell my friend what you said. I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> that was you in the most general sense of the word. That was you to the whole internet. <laughs> but yeah, the only, really, bottom line, uh, you got to ask her out at some point. That's my advice. So anyone else, questions? Yes. Well, I know we talked about this last week though in here, but what's a good way to retreat when you know you already overstepped some of the friendship boundaries? Ah, okay. Like, retreat nicely. Okay, well now it depends on a couple of things. Uh, first, how how intensive a friendship was before and like how solid, mm -hmm. uh, how long you've been friends before. And number two, um, are you the one who sort of stepped over or is he the one who sort of stepped over? That sort of changes the name. Um, it, 
depending on how things have gone, it may be able to end well, or it may just be, good Lord, I will never make eye contact with you again after this. Um, my advice would be, assuming that it's, let me give you a scenario um, to make it a little bit more concrete. Um, you, you are the friend of Eric's friend, um, and he's begun asking you out, and like, you sort of suspect something the first time he said, hey, you want to go out and get some coffee, like, you know, I know this cool cafe in town. Um, and you're like, hey, yeah, you know, I'll tell Bob, well, actually, I was just hoping it could be us. Oh. And you sort of feel that little question right there. <coughs> maybe you're more friends, maybe he just wanted to go hang out. And you go, and you have an all right time, but the whole back of time you're thinking, good Lord, I hope you don't think this is a date. I really want this to be a date. You know, you know. A, it is a date by definition. Um, but B, I hope he doesn't think there's romance here. So you go back, he asks you out again. And you're like, yes, because you're too chicken to say no. Um, or to say, I need to clarify something right now. Um, do you just want to hang out with me? Or are you wanting to go out with me? Um, but because you, you, know, you go again, and you find yourself like on the third day, um, and Eric's friend is about to say to you, um, hey, you know, I've really enjoyed these last few uh, times we've had together, and I was wondering, um, you want to start seeing one another regularly, like sort of romantically. Um, and you have to like answer that. How can you do it in a way that does not leave a smoking crater in the ground? Um, there's no guarantee that you can. Um, at that point, the, the, there's much momentum to this ship. <laughs> um, and steering it away from the, from the beach is not going to be easy. Um, but here are the key. Absolute honesty. There, there, a, deception is never good anyway. But in this case, deception will destroy you. It really will. You just have to say, okay, I'm sorry. Um, a, I own whatever part is legitimately your stone. Don't own more than you should, honestly. Um, like, don't say it's all your fault. It's not all your fault. There's mutual misunderstanding. But I'm sorry. I, I should have said something earlier. I thought maybe this was happening. Um, we're good friends. I value friendship. I don't want to end that. But I just don't see a romance between us. Um, and if it's because you have a crush on someone else, there's someone else I like. Throw that in there. Um, and if it's just that there's no way I could ever see myself dating you. Um, don't use those exact words. <laughs> <laughs> but just say, um, you know, no, no, but just say, like, you know, for, for romance to work, I think there have to be a lot of different factors. Um, and not just friendship. We've got the friendship. But there has to be sort of a, a spark as well. And honestly, I just don't feel that. Um, and the kindest thing I can do right now is just let you know. Now, I still want to keep the friendship. And if you can, if you can deal with that, we'll keep it up. Um, and if not, I'm really sorry. I shouldn't let this go this far. That would be one way to handle it. That's got at least a reasonable chance. Yeah. Um, like, what are, what are your commands in terms of like long distance relationships? Right. So, actually, there's something really good about long distance relationships. Um, one of the things about long distance relationships is there's much less physical temptation, um, <laughs> uh, and that's not a bad thing. The other good thing about long distance relationships is you can really sort of test the commitment level in the relationship. Um, it's not easy to keep a long distance relationship on by default. Well, it is sort of if you lie. Like, you know, yeah, baby, I think about you every day. Um, <laughs> honey, I write letters to you every day. I just don't send them because I don't want you to, you know, whatever. Um, whereas, you know, you're playing the field when you're back here. I mean, if you're lying, it's one thing. But if you really are keeping it up, um, that's a real st I, I would say, in general, I would urge you not to, to marry someone until you spend some time apart and come back together. And I mean, at least a month or two. Uh, we've been separated by the summer or by a study abroad program. Because if, if your relationship can endure that, it's a very promising sign. Now, if your relationship's just long distance, like you've never had a, a regular, I would definitely make sure that before I accepted any sort of engagement proposal or anything, that I had spent some time with that person face to face for more than a weekend, but like a month or two. Um, because it's easy to look good from a distance. Um, it is real easy to look good from a distance. Um, it is much harder to be consistently nice and polite and, and front uh, for, for a prolonged period of time. And also in that case, it'd be very important to me, more so than normal, who are that person's friends? You can tell a lot about a person by their friends. Friends don't accidentally find one another. If a person's friends are all a bunch of scoundrels and he's really nice, okay, he's a scoundrel too. <laughs> He's nice to you. Um, that's just, and that's a 10-2 rule, not an absolute rule. Um, 
but I find it pretty helpful. Okay, it's 9.30. Um, if you need to leave, you're welcome to leave at this point. Uh, I can take a few more questions. Maybe I'll, I'll handle three or four more before I actually close things out to keep up more hands start shooting up. But if you got a jet, this is your, your excuse. So Kyle and then Alan. Kyle. Uh, what about necrophilia? What about necrophilia? Um, <laughs> necrophilia is very bad. It's a sin in the Bible. Um, and uh, it's just gross to boot. Don't do that. Um, I actually talked about that last week. Very, he's not weird. Nobody ostracized Kyle. <laughs> um, what you say? You planted. That's good. That's good. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I told someone. But actually, um, if you want to talk about why necrophilia is wrong, Tom, I'd be happy to do that in more detail. Okay. So this question. Does anybody know what necrophilia is? <laughs> okay. Uh, philia meaning love of. Necro meaning dead. Um, and so people who sleep with dead people. Um, <laughs> it is gross. And it actually happens. Um, uh, and it's in the Bible because that's a sin people wrestle with. Not a lot. It's a minority population. Um, but that's wrong. Don't do it. Alan. Okay, so. Uh, <laughs> I'm not related to them. <laughs> yeah. uh, the question is sort of about uh, sort of to what extent should you go uh, sort of be active about finding the right wells? Like, because you said number one, trust God. Yeah. Uh, but then, like, uh, like in the, the story, the servant had to like go somewhere to, like, right. you know, but like, yeah. yeah. Uh, so the sort of the alternatives are like constantly like, like this speed dating thing would be yeah. one extreme. The other extreme would be just like sitting in your room all the time. Right. Um, and you know, like which no one at Stanford ever does. Okay. <laughs> right. So like, what do you think? I guess the the problem with sitting in your room, or not sitting in your room yeah. physically, but like, we have these like friend pools, and yeah. you tend to have a fairly constant friend pool like yeah. for most of your time at Stanford, for example. Right. Um, you have a draw group, or if you're a grad student, people in your lab, that kind of thing. Yeah, so like, what's the appropriate amount of uh, like going out of your way to meet people that one ought to be doing? Well, I mean, a lot of it depends on your personality. You're an introvert, you're an extrovert, you know, your work demands me. There's no rule for this. Um, but I would say, okay, there's a proverb that has been very helpful to me in life. It's not a proverb from the Bible, it's a proverb from, from a culture in Africa. It says, trust God, but grow away from the rocks. Um, in other words, if you're in a shipwreck, uh, yes, pray for help, but like, if you're in that boat and you're coming up, you paddle for all your work. Um, uh, Nehemiah 4.9, and by the way, I think from the Bible, Nehemiah 4.9 reads this principle. Threats were made against the city that Nehemiah was building a wall around, and he said, so we prayed to the Lord our God, and we mounted a watch on the walls. We trusted God, and we took productive action. I would say, um, if you're at a point in your life where you're really thinking about, like, romance more than, like, you know, the younger you are, the less serious of a thought it is for you. It's just like, I mean, it's overwhelming emotion sometimes of infatuation, but you don't really think about, wow, like, I'm at the age where I should be thinking about marriage. Um, but as you get, and this is important, because in college you tend to shift. Like, you come in not really thinking about marriage at all, for most people. And then, somewhere around the time you graduate, you're like, wow, my parents were married at this age. I, and you start serving your friends' weddings. Like as a, as a, and that all of a sudden you're thinking more and more. You're like, wow, um, the 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 pool of potential mates is shrinking. He just stole one. Um, I better get on this thing. Um, the more that becomes a thought in your life, I would say you need to become much more proactive, um, and and just begin. I would say probably weekly, trying to find some way of spending social time with people of the opposite gender outside the, red, the, the, the small circle of friends. I don't, I don't even say you have to find a completely new pool every time, but I would say make a discipline weekly, maybe bi-weekly, but less than that, hey, it's a personality thing. It may be for you. Um, but I would say that would be a very, very prudent thing of, of someone to do who is feeling like this is important in their life. Does that make sense? Yeah. And by that I mean, for example, um, uh, if your church has a non-weird singles group, like, you know what I mean? Some singles groups are like, oh, good lord. No, just no. Um, don't go there. Um, but if there's perhaps there's some sort of a parachurch ministry, um, they tend to attract, they don't always, but tend to attract younger people, um, depending on the type of ministry. Maybe you could be involved with that. Um, by that, for example, maybe some sort of a, a prison outreach or homeless outreach or something, but a thing where you find a group of people who are in that same range as you, or a ministry team that you can be a part of at your church, 
um, or obviously groups like High Alfred, right? Um, or, you know, honestly, that may be a significant factor in your choosing of a church when you move away from Stanford. Um, like right now, it's not such a big deal because you're surrounded by people your age. That's the whole campus, just about. Uh, but when you graduate, you get a job. Well, you know, your coworker might be like 50, and while that is theoretically dateable, um, for most of us, functionally, we're not going to do that. Um, and you find that you know you have this huge diversity of people around you, and they're not all in this monoculture. Maybe you should pick a church in part. I mean, of course, the most important thing is they're a good Christian church, like they actually believe the Bible. They preach non-heretical things. Um, this is the kind of place you would invite a, a non-believing friend to. That, that, those are all the most important. But you'll find a lot of churches like that wherever you move. Well, are there a lot of potentially dateable people here? That's not, a, that's not an evil or selfish question to ask. It's a very reasonable question. Um, so, for example, the, the pastor I quoted earlier, Mark Batterson, his church in Washington, D.C. is like 80%, 20 to 30-year-olds, most of whom are single. Well, if I'm in D.C. and I'm single and I'm... I'm Lamenting that fact, I'm giving that church serious consideration. That would be. So that would be the weekly criteria, by the way, also. Every Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> Two birds, one stone. Hello. <laughs> it's, okay, I'll take maybe one or two more questions. I'll do the rest one on one. Uh, Joel? Uh, Melanie asked this last week, and I'm very curious uh, what you think of it. Uh, like, what's the. How does uh, a romantic love. Is related to the general love that, that Christians are supposed to have. Ah, they both involve tongues. No, um. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Um, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 14, that's right in there. Anyway, no, um, uh, that's a very good question. I'm going to talk more about that next week when I talk about uh, physical boundaries. I'll talk about the difference between lust and love and affection and those sorts of things. So it's a great question, but I'll hold off on it. By the way, uh, well, I'll talk next week. Yes. Sean. Yeah, this last question, please. Uh, does anyone else say anything? Does anyone else have one? Yeah. You can arm wrestle Sean for it. Yeah. <laughs> right, okay, so um, I'm guessing, so let's say you want to you wanna begin like a dating process. Um, should you, so we talk about trusting God and, yeah. and all that, kind of like where you like to first in the first place. Yeah. Uh, should you wait for like a go ahead kind of thing? Is there, in like, prayer? A, yeah. Do you have to feel like, do you have to feel the sense of, yeah, God is saying, go for it, you know? Or is that something important, or? Okay, this is a much broader topic that ties into how Christians relate to the will of God generally. Um, and it sort of depends on which, which category you put romantic relationships into. Um, so, like, obviously there's decisions we make every day, like, what clothes will I wear? I hope you don't pray about that. You just sort of... You have this internal, like, moral compass that says, I should be clothed. Um, and, and I have clothes, therefore I will wear them. I mean, it's a very simple sort of method. Um, or, you know, you know, should I have the teriyaki or the, you know, I mean, simple decisions like that, routine decisions. Um, or, you know, even, uh, well, routine decisions. Then there are more substantive and substantive decisions, like, um, Lord, are you calling me into ministry or not? Uh, God, I don't know whether or not... Um, I should, you know, truck move to this new city. It's a, it's a big change, and I, I need your guidance on it. Those are life-altering decisions. Um, and it's somewhat a personal judgment call which category you put this into. Um, if you define dates very casually, like I do, a date is a just social interaction between two people of the opposite gender, um, then no, you probably need to pray before, before one of those. Um, but you probably would choose to pray before um, beginning an exclusive romantic relationship, so a serious romantic relationship. Um, I would suggest you don't treat those as just trivial decisions. Um, but there's a lot of, of personal conviction that comes to bear on the way that we, we walk this out. So, hey, join me in prayer. God, if you want us to be married, help us find the right person. And if you want us to be single, give us satisfaction in that. And don't allow us to be overwhelmingly distracted or tempted by those around us. Um, but whatever our call is, God, Help us walk in it wisely. And when we need it, speak clearly that we may obey your voice. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. Amen.